Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman, and we're taking a look today at something rather unique. This is the Cavo, and this is a universal remote control device that takes all of your favorite set-top boxes, connects them up via HDMI, and you can control them through the Cavo box on your television. And it also has another feature where it can go out and find the content you're looking to watch and then pull up the box that has it so you can watch it without having to poke around on three or four different devices. And a good use case for this might be one we'll look at in a few minutes where uh, my NVIDIA Shield here cannot play HBO Go on Comcast, but my Apple TV can. So if I want to load up something on HBO, the Cavo will automatically switch to the Apple TV and find that content there for us, which is kind of interesting. And the price is pretty low too at 99 bucks, but it's not all there just yet. We're gonna look into this and see exactly what it can and can't do in just a minute. But I do wanna let you know in the interest of full disclosure, this did come in free of charge from Cavo. However, all the opinions you're about to hear are my own. Nobody is paying for this review, nor has anyone reviewed or approved what you're about to see before it was uploaded. So let's get into it now and see what this thing is all about. So let's take a closer look now at the hardware. Again, this is $99 for the box, but you also have a subscription fee to get a bulk of its features enabled, unfortunately. Uh, $2 a month or $20 a year and that's for all of the content aggregation stuff that we're going to be taking a look at in a few minutes. If you don't pay that, it still works, but it's just going to work as a universal remote device. And even for 99 bucks without the subscription, that's probably not a bad price to pay for that basic functionality. And in my opinion, the basic functionality is actually better than the uh, content stuff that you're going to be paying monthly for. So we'll explore all of that here uh, in just a second. Now on the back here, you've got four HDMI ports. We have a bunch of things already connected to it. This port here is what you connect your TV or your home theater system to. Uh, right here is a network jack. You can plug it into your Ethernet network or you can have it run over Wi-Fi. Uh, in my testing, Wi-Fi has been just fine. It doesn't require that much bandwidth like your boxes might, so I think uh, you'll be fine if you don't have a free Ethernet connection there. Uh, this sticker here is not to be used, <laughs> but it is a USB port uh, that you'll find underneath that, but it's not being used for anything at the moment. Uh, the box is running Android, but there is no uh, apps or anything else that install on it. It is strictly running the Cavo software. Uh, this is an IR port. Uh, so they do give you an IR blaster in the box, which I'll talk about in a minute. And that is it for your inputs beyond the power there. On the front here, as you can see, there's nothing to it, uh, but you do have a button here for finding the remote control. And the remote is very important because everything that you'll control is through this particular remote. It does support voice input, which we'll demonstrate in a few minutes, uh, but you cannot pass voice commands from the Cavo to one of your boxes directly. So if you decided you want to talk to your Apple TV with its voice control, you got to go get your Apple TV remote to have that conversation. Uh, but you can, of course, search the catalog through the Cavo and have the Cavo find the content you asked for on the Apple TV. But the search, of course, is not going to be as good as the Google Assistant or uh, Siri will be. So just keep all of that in mind. Now the build quality on the box is not spectacular. It's plastic in this piano finish, uh, but it scratches very easily. I got a couple of scuff marks here just moving it around the house to uh, test it out on a few different TVs. Had a similar experience here with the remote. It's going to show some wear uh, pretty quickly just because it is a very shiny plastic case. Now the setup process was not all that difficult, but it was a little time consuming. Uh, for four devices that I connected to it, it took about 45 minutes to get everything fully functional. A lot of these devices required me to download an app that it used to uh, communicate with those particular devices. Uh, the Roku here it actually connected to over my local network. So it picks kind of the best way to uh, be able to access your devices. And if you've got one that can't be controlled via the network or HDMI, uh, there's also an infrared option that will replicate your TV remote control. Uh, so if you have something it just won't control with anything else, you can plug that thing in and get it working with that. Uh, that might take a little bit longer to get set up, but once it is working, you shouldn't have to touch it again. Now, Cavo says this box is compatible with HDR televisions, and it also should work with home theater receivers and sound bars. I've got a brand new home theater receiver upstairs from Yamaha along with my LG OLED set and unfortunately HDR did not work properly. The Cavo never detected HDR coming out of my TV even though it has it 
and I was not able to get my NVIDIA Shield and other 4K devices here to display properly as a result. The colors were all out of whack, the picture was very dim, and I had no way to force the Cavo to uh, enable HDR that would have corrected those issues. So I think you're going to run into some trouble here if you have to rely upon the Cavo to detect everything properly. It just didn't seem to work in my configuration and I had no way to override it. I did run into this problem with my Xbox last year. I was able to force an override through their software, but Cavo at the moment doesn't support that. It also doesn't support Dolby Vision. So if you have an Apple TV or a Blu-ray player that supports Dolby Vision, it's not going to look so great either. In fact, it might be a bunch of purple you'll see on screen uh, as a result, as you can see here. So the HDR just is a little quirky at the moment. And again, I think it's because of perhaps how it's trying to detect your television equipment. And if it offered a way to override that detection, uh, that would certainly have made this a little bit easier for me. But as a result, I can't recommend it right now for 4K home theater people. So let's take a look now and see how this thing works. At its core, it's a universal remote and HDMI switch box. And again, this feature is what you get without the subscription. So I've got my NVIDIA Shield up right here. I can control it and move around with the remote here. I don't have to worry about finding my Shield remote, for example. And if I click on the big Cavo button here, I can switch over to a different device by selecting Devices. And I can go, for example, over to my Apple TV and it will switch to that. Switching is a little on the slower side. You can see it takes it a second and then it does a resolution uh, refresh there as well. But not bad, about what you would probably get out of your television perhaps. Uh, what's neat about the remote is that it has capacitive buttons that will give you an indicator as to what the Cavo's remote button will do on a particular device. So right now I'm on my Apple TV. If I just place my finger without pushing the button over the home button here, it'll tell me what that will do on the Apple TV, in this case going home. Uh, but know that the remote is not backlit, so this is probably a way to get around having to backlight the remote. Uh, but it is helpful to know what these buttons will do on a particular device, and I thought that was rather smart of them. They do have a lot of nice little features on this like that that I think make it easy for consumers to understand. Now, in addition to being able to switch between specific devices, you can also switch apps on the Cavo, and it will load the app up on the right device. So, for example, if I push my silver button here on the Roku screen and go to Apps here, uh, what I'll have is an option to select maybe iTunes Movies, and what it will do is it will switch away from the Roku and then automatically load up the Movies app on my Apple TV. And this is kind of one of the unique features of this particular device. So what it's doing uh, is getting all that going for me, but it does take a while for that switch to occur. In fact, I think you could probably uh, switch your TV input and load up the Movies app faster than the Cavo is currently doing it. But there you go, we've got the Movies uh, selected there. Uh, likewise, if I want to load up Plex, which I'm going to run from my NVIDIA Shield, I just select Plex here on the Cavo menu. It will then switch over to the Shield and hopefully will invoke uh, Plex for us there in the process. We'll see what happens there. Again, it takes a little bit of time for all of this stuff to occur, but if you're looking for a single remote solution, uh, you'll be able to do that. So there we go. We have uh, Plex loaded up right now. Now you also have the ability to assign specific devices for specific apps, and I'll show you that screen here real quick. Uh, in the settings option here, you go over to apps and credentials, and then you click on preferred devices and you can see what I have set up right now. So for example, uh, HBO Go, which I do have on my NVIDIA Shield, I want to have load up on the Apple TV because my cable provider Comcast doesn't allow me to watch HBO Go on my Shield. So I can select the device that works best with it here. And so that is all the defaults that I set up, but you could of course change that. So if I wanted Plex to be uh, on my Apple TV instead, I can do that. And anytime I invoke Plex, it will know to go to the Apple TV. Now, all the features you just saw are things that you can use without that ongoing subscription. Uh, but if you want to do more than that, all the stuff I'm gonna show you next, you will need that subscription. So let's take a look now and see what you get for your two bucks a month. Now, one of the big features they're touting here with the Cavo is its directory of content. So I can hold down the microphone here and say, Star Trek The Next Generation. And what it's going to do now is go and execute a search for the show that I'm looking for. And if we go over here on top results, you can see uh, what I got for options. So I can maybe go over here to the show itself. I've got seven seasons. 
I can get details about the show. I can go over here and click watch on and it will tell me where it's available. Uh, so on Amazon, I've got to rent or buy it. Uh, same with the other services here that I have configured, but I could go to Netflix and watch it if I wanted to. And if I click on Netflix now, what it's going to do is switch over to my NVIDIA Shield and pull up Netflix for me and then go and find uh, the first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation here. Of course, I've got my HDCP error because I've got it plugged into a monitor, but you can see at least that it was able to track that episode down and play it for me. But unfortunately, the Cavo just doesn't support many apps. In fact, the apps it currently supports are likely already on your Roku or your smart television or one of your other devices. And many devices now have very robust universal search capabilities built in. So for example, if I search for Ghostbusters 2, uh, this is what I get for options, Vudu, Amazon Video, and iTunes Movies. If I close out of here and go over to my Roku, uh, what you're going to find is many more search options available to me and different places to watch the movie. So for example, it's on the free Roku channel, which is not supported on the Cavo. It's on Sony Crackle for free as well. I can rent it on Fandango and Google Play Movies. So I just get more here out of the cheaper Roku and all of those apps can be loaded up on the Roku and function uh, just the same way this elaborate device can function. So I, I just don't know if this is something that people need right now. And that's why I'm kind of curious as to what they're going to to do with this subscription service moving forward. I think it would have a lot more value if I could go out and uh, search around within my cord cutting applications like the HD Home Run app or Plex Live TV. It doesn't support any of those things right now. They have some neat technology though where the Cavo can actually navigate interfaces and search for things like you would if you were sitting there with the remote control. I saw it do that with my Amazon Fire TV when it was setting itself up. It actually found the app and downloaded it uh, just kind of automatically like a robot. It's kind of creepy actually watching it. Uh, so I'm guessing they've got the ability to do this, but it's going to take time for them to uh, get every app compatible with it. And then every time an app maker changes the interface, it's probably going to trip up uh, what they're putting together here. So I just don't see the value here of the subscription fee to do all of this stuff because again, uh, the devices you have already are likely already capable of this. And another issue with the Cavo Media Library is that it doesn't know what you already own. So for example, here I've got uh, Aladdin pulled up on screen. I own this movie on Vudu and iTunes along with the Blu-ray too. And if I go ahead and try to watch it here by pushing the button, uh, you can see it's getting that remote signal here. It's blinking, but nothing is happening because whatever database provider they're using for uh, this consolidated information just doesn't have it available on any streaming services. Yet I know I've got it on at least two. Now they do have an option to connect up your account credentials with your Cavo account. So I thought maybe I would go in there and give that a shot. The problem though is that when I do that, it brings me basically right back to the beginning of the setup process again. And when I go ahead and follow the link on my laptop and do all this stuff, I get put right back to where I was before and never had the option to enter in my Amazon account, for example. So if there is a way uh, to go in and see what you own and put it as part of the database, it's just not working right now at the time this thing has been released. And I think that's a big issue, especially when you're expecting people to pay a subscription for your product. At least it could do is actually work uh, and provide the content that you have in your own personal libraries. But I was pleased to see that it does support Plex. And you can see when we do an Aladdin search over there, we are able to watch it. The problem though is it doesn't integrate that Plex result in with the rest of the results here. I would have liked to have seen uh, my Plex option here just on this list as opposed to having to scroll over to the left and go all the way down to Plex to see what I'm looking for. And it's also not always searching Plex that effectively. Watch this, Star Wars The Last Jedi. So I know this movie is on my Plex server, if I do the search, I've got it available on iTunes. Again, it doesn't know that I already own it. And if I go down here to OnPlex, oops, I went too far. If I go down to OnPlex, it'll show me that it doesn't have any results, even though I know for a fact it's sitting on that Plex server right now. And many times I can ask one of my other devices to play it by voice and it will. So there's just a lot missing here. And the value proposition that they're making for why this is a subscription product is this database. It's just not working right for me. I think it needs tremendous improvement before I can recommend anyone uh, pay for this subscription. 
Uh, that said, it does have some other things that might be of interest to some folks. They've got a curated uh, watch list here. So if you wanted to see maybe some of the best animated films of all time, you can pull down a list that the uh, magazine Elle put together and you can find all these different movies and see where they are. And the funny thing is Aladdin is on this and you can't actually watch it. Uh, so there's just a lot of things here that just don't uh, work, work out well for me here. And again, you can get curated watch lists on a bunch of other devices you probably already have. Uh, there is some value perhaps to folks who have existing cable subscriptions. It does work with Comcast and Time Warner Cable and DirecTV. It also works with Sling TV and PlayStation View at the time I'm recording this video, but it doesn't work with a lot of other things that cord cutters are using. Uh, my HD Home Run app isn't compatible. Plex Live TV and DVR doesn't work with it. So there's just so much missing here that I can't really find any way to justify this for most consumers unless you are really, really troubled by having more than one device connected to your TV and not able to find anything. This might help you out a little bit, but it doesn't get you all the way there. And to be honest, you might be better off with a Roku that has uh, probably the most robust app support out of all the set-top players on the market and get that for a lot less money and a lot less aggravation. So altogether, I have to say this is a very decent universal remote, believe it or not, for $99. In fact, the core functionality is very sound and I think a very good value. The interface here is really nice. Uh, it's very easy to get from one device to the other. Everything can work with a single remote control. You can turn on or turn off all of your devices, including your stereo receiver and your TV, just with this single remote. I love the little uh, cheat thing that they've got here. So when you rest your finger on a button, you can see what that translates to on the device you're using there. All that is great stuff, but the subscription program is pretty bad at the moment, and I certainly don't recommend paying for that. So what I would do is get it if you're looking for a universal remote and you like that part of the functionality you saw. Try out the subscription thing for 45 days. I think you'll find, like I did, that it's just not worth the money. Cancel that, and then just use it as a universal remote and hope that the company doesn't change their mind and deactivate that functionality down the road. Unfortunately, we've seen a few companies do that, but hopefully they will not be among them. Uh, but really, it's just crazy that the tech press has gone as nuts over this thing as they have because I just don't see the value of what they've put together on that uh, media database and some of the other stuff. It's got some novel features where it can actually navigate some of the apps automatically, but I'm not seeing it do all that much with it. And again, the app support is so limited here, I think you're better off with a Roku if you're looking for universal access to a lot of media that's out there. So. Again, 99 bucks for a universal remote, great. Just don't do the subscription and I think you'll be pleased with it. And hopefully they'll make some improvements to add some value to that subscription to make it worth paying for. Until next time, this is Lon Sybin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters, Chris Allegretta, the Four Guys with Quarters podcast, Tom Albrecht, Too Much Sauce, Gerard Newberg, and Kalyan Kumar. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.